starting with chapter 16. I'll be doing as I have been all through this, reading brief selections from each chapter. Uh, we're still not going as quickly as we should through these books, but um, this one had a lot of practical material, I thought, about any country that claims to be of God, and then if they go back on him, how God punishes, uh, but he also has a remnant left, no matter how small it may be, and that's always a very positive thing as well. Jeremiah, of course, has a lot of enemies. The sad part of it is many of them are his own people, his own family. The priests, the prophets, the king, he has to rebuke all of them. Remember at one time in our reading here, God challenged him to find one person in the city of Jerusalem that was righteous. And there wasn't one. So things got really bad with the country. And God got fed up. We learned uh, already last week that he told Jeremiah, don't even pray for him anymore. I've made up my mind, and I'm going to punish him. So in chapter 16, Jeremiah is going to be told not to get married and not to have children because of the disaster that is ahead. We'll read this in verses 1 through 7 of chapter 16. Then the word of the Lord came to me. You must not marry and have sons or daughters in this place. For this is what the Lord says about the sons and daughters born in this land and about the women who are their mothers and the men who are their fathers. They will die of deadly diseases. They will not be mourned or buried, but will be like dung lying on the ground. They will perish by sword and famine, and their dead bodies will become food for the bird and the wild animals. For this is what the Lord says, do not enter a house where there is a funeral meal. And I think that's sort of interesting. We may think of the funeral meal as a modern invention, but it goes way back. In other words, he doesn't want him to even mourn over these people. Do not go to mourn or show sympathy, because I have withdrawn my blessing. My love and my pity from this people, declares the Lord. Both high and low will die in this land. They will not be buried or mourned, and no one will cut themselves or shave their head for the dead. That's showing grief. No one will offer food to comfort those who mourn for the dead, not even for a father or a mother, nor will anyone give them a drink to console them. Now, in verses 10 through 13 of chapter 16, we're going to see the answer that Jeremiah is supposed to give the people when they ask, why did God let this happen or do this? Now, God did not only let it happen. We're going to see in various verses, he said, I personally am involved in doing this to you. Now let's notice here, starting with verse number 10. When you tell these people all this and they ask you, that's God saying that, why has the Lord decreed such a great disaster against us? What wrong have we done? Now the Bible, through Jeremiah and all the prophets, have listed the atrocious sins of these people. And yet they were blind to it all. What wrong have we done? What sin have we committed against the Lord our God? Then say to them, 
It is because your ancestors forsook me, declares the Lord, and followed other gods and served and worshipped them. They forsook me and did not keep my law. But you have behaved more wickedly than your ancestors. See how all of you are following the stubbornness of your evil hearts instead of obeying me? So I will throw you out of this land into a land neither you nor your ancestors have known, and there you will serve other gods day and night, for I will show you no favor. In chapter 17, as it starts out in verse number 4, God is putting the whole blame on the people. In other words, don't look to me and say it's my fault. Now look at verse 4 of chapter 17. This is God speaking. Through your own fault, you will lose the inheritance I gave you. I will enslave you to your enemies in a land you do not know, for you have kindled my anger, and it will burn forever. However, as I said, there's always a light at the end of the tunnel with God. Look at verses 7 and 8. As the Lord addresses those blessed ones who trust him. Verses 7 and 8. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when he comes, its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. Now in verse 10, we're going to notice that the Lord rewards people according to their conduct. Not what they say, but what they do. It's easy for people to say the right things, even religious people. It was proven that Jeremiah's people were doing the right things when it came to temple worship, right down the line. But when they left temple worship, they went in the hills and bowed down to idols. And we're going to notice again, before we quit here in a few minutes, that they also were built, burning their children alive to those false gods. So it's not the words he wanted to hear. In fact, the Lord over and again is going to tell them that your assemblies make me sick. Now, let's notice verse 10 of chapter number 17. I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. So that's very, very important that our deeds match our faith, our deeds match our words. As we examine chapter 18, I'd like for you to start with verse number 11. And notice there's a call for the people still to repent. God lets them have a chance to repent up to the last minute. They have an opportunity to do so, but they don't take it. Look at verse 7 all the way through 12. If at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down and destroyed. And if that nation I warned repents of its evil, then I will relent 
and not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. And if at another time I announce that a nation or a kingdom is to be built up and planted, and if it does evil in my sight and does not obey me, then I will reconsider the good I had intended to do for it. Now, therefore, say to the people of Judah and those living in Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says. Look, I'm preparing a disaster for you and devising a plan against you. So turn from your evil ways, each one of you, and reform your ways and your actions. But they will reply, it's no use. We will continue with our own plans. We will all follow the stubbornness of our evil hearts. Now in verses 18... And following, we're going to notice that the people conduct a verbal attack upon Jeremiah. Now, this is what's usually done first against the prophets. They attack them verbally. And then they begin to attack them physically, as what happened also uh, to Jeremiah. But look now, beginning with verse number 18. They said, now these are the people, come, let's make plans against Jeremiah. For the teaching of the law by the priest will not cease, nor will counsel from the wise. You see, he was warning the people that this would all happen. They said, no, God's not going to do that. Before, they said, no, he's not going to tear down his temple. No matter what Jeremiah says, he will not do anything to his temple. He will not do anything to his people. He loves his house of worship too much. They said, nor the word from the prophets. So come, let's attack him with our tongues and pay no attention to anything he says. So the first thing, just ignore him. And then belittle him and call him a liar. Listen to me, Lord. Now, this is Jeremiah talking to God in verse 19. Hear what my accusers are saying. Should good be repaid with evil? Yet they have dug a pit for me. Remember that I stood before you and spoke in their behalf to turn your wrath away from them. You see, he kept trying to defend them before God, but there was just no defense. I mean, they, just, they were just too bad. So give their children over the famine. That's what he's saying now to God. Hand them over to the power of the sword. Let their wives be made childless and window widows. Let their men be put to death, their young men slain by the sword in battle. Let a cry be heard from their houses. Now you see even Jeremiah getting fed up when you suddenly bring invaders against them, for they have dug a pit to capture me and have hidden snares for my feet. And that's exactly what they did. They threw him in a pit. But you, Lord, know all their plots to kill me. Do not forgive their crimes or blot out their sins from your sight. Let them be overthrown before you. Deal with them in the time of your anger. So even now, Jeremiah is starting to finally notice what God was telling him all along. Quit praying for them. Quit defending them. Get out of my way. I'm going to abolish them. Now notice in chapter 19, starting with verse 5, we reiterate again some of their sins. Look at verse number 5. God is speaking to them through Jeremiah. They have built the high places of Baal, to burn their children in the fire as offerings to Baal, something I did not command or mention, nor did it enter my mind. So beware the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the people no longer call this place Topheth, or the valley of Ben-Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. 
Verse 7, in this place I'll ruin the plans of Judah and Jerusalem. I will make them fall by the sword before their enemies at the hands of those who want to kill them. And I will give their carcasses as food to the birds and the wild animals. Now notice God's personal intervening here. I will do this. I will devastate this city and make it an object of horror and scorn. Verse 8. All who will pass by will be appalled and will scoff because of all its wounds. Now, notice in verse 9, God said, I. Now, this is what happened. I told you before what happened in the city of Jerusalem when he said that there would be a famine. I will make them eat the flesh of their sons and daughters, and they will eat one another's flesh, because their enemies will press the seed so hard against them to destroy them. We're going to notice that God does give them a way out. He tells Jeremiah, tell the people, if they get out of town, get out of Jerusalem, they will avoid all of this. They don't even listen to that. He's trying to, trying to warn them. But, but they won't even listen to that. And now I want you to look in chapter 20, starting with verse 1, how the priest in charge of the temple was against Jeremiah. I mean, everybody is against him. The priests, the politicians, the people. Look at verse number 1 and through verse 4. When the priest Pasher, son of Immer, and the official in charge of the temple of the Lord heard Jeremiah prophesying these things. He had Jeremiah the prophet beaten and put in stocks at the upper gate of Benjamin at the Lord's ta uh, temple. The next day when Pasher released him from the stocks, Jeremiah said to him, The Lord's name for you is not Pasher, but terror on every side. For this is what the Lord says. I will make you a terror to yourself and to all your friends. With your own eyes, you will see them fall by the sword of their enemies. I will give all Judah in the hands of the king of Babylon, who will carry them away to Babylon or put them to the sword. I will deliver all the wealth of this city to the hands of their enemies, all its products, all its valuables, all the treasures of the kings of Judah. They will take it away as plunder and carry it off to Babylon. Now, Jeremiah, in verses 7 through 9, complains to God. Notice this. He's <laughs> accusing God of deceiving him. That's so funny how us humans talk to God, isn't it? Jeremiah said in verse 7, chapter 20, You deceived me, Lord, when I and I was deceived. You overpowered me and prevailed. I am ridiculed all day long. Everyone mocks me. Whenever I speak, I cry out, proclaiming violence and destruction. So the word of the Lord has brought me insult and reproach all day long. However, even in his complaint, he begins to say things like this in verse 9. But if I say I will not mention his word or speak any more in his name, now this is a compulsion. He, he, he doesn't like this idea of being persecuted for preaching. But he has this fire in his heart, this compulsion that he has to do it. So he says, but if I say I will not mention his word or speak any more in his name, his word is in my heart like a fire, fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. I hear many whispering terror on every side. Denounce him. Let's denounce him. All my friends are awaiting for me to slip, saying, perhaps he will be deceived. Then we will prevail over him and take our revenge on him. We've already seen where his family was against him. Now we see his friends are against him. The priests were against him. Uh, 
all the politicians were against him. And I guess he thinks even God is against him. But yet, he has a little change of tune in verse 11 as he approaches God. But the Lord is with me like a mighty warrior, so my persecutors will stumble and not prevail. They will fail and be thoroughly disgraced. Their dishonor will never be forgotten. The Lord Almighty, you who examine, Lord Almighty, you who examine the righteous and probe the heart and mind, let me see your vengeance on them. For you I have committed my cause. And even in verse 13, then, he begins to praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord. Give praise to the Lord. He rescues the life of the needy from the hands of the wicked. But then he goes back into self-pity. <laughs> he goes back and forth. Now, James in his little book in the New Testament calls, calls, talks about a double-minded man. It's unstable in all his ways. It seems like here that Jeremiah is a little bit unstable. But then when I think of it, I think I'd be a little unstable myself if I was in the exact position he was in. I mean, I've been in un unstable in a lot less situations than this. But notice what he says in verse 14 of chapter 20. Cursed be the day I was born. May the day my mother bore me not be blessed. Same kind of language that Job used. Cursed be the man who brought my father the news about his birth, who made him very glad, saying, A child is born to you, a son. May that man be like the towns the Lord overthrew without pity. May he hear wailing in the morning, a battle cry at noon. For he did not kill me in the womb. He just wished he was killed in the womb. With my mother as my grave, her womb enlarged forever. Why did I ever come out of the womb to see trouble and sorrow, to end my days in shame? So the Bible's very honest. God is very honest about his people. He shows the good side and the bad side. He did with David. Uh, he did with Solomon. He, he did uh, with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He did with the disciples. Uh, he didn't uh, color them perfect. He showed the bad side, and I'm glad he did, because that's the way I am too. So let's look at chapter 21, and we're going to notice here a very interesting thing. In chapter 21, Babylon is getting close. They're starting to do some damage. They're not in town yet. But they're starting to do some damage in Judea, and the people are finally waking up. In verses 1 and 2, the king and some priests are asking Jeremiah to go to God for a miracle. Now, this is very interesting reading. Look at verses 1 and 2 first of chapter 21. Zedekiah is the king. The word came to Jeremiah from the Lord when King Zedekiah sent him to Pasher. We already read about that uh, priest who uh, threw him in jail. Son of Malchijah and the priest Zephaniah, son of Maziah. They said, this is what they told him, Inquire now of the Lord for us. Because Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, is attacking us. Duh. Jeremiah was telling them every minute what was happening. Then they said, perhaps the Lord will perform wonders for us as in times past so that he will withdraw from us. I like the answer, <clears throat> starting with verse 3. Where God is so upset, he said, I myself will fight against you. But Jeremiah answered them, tell Zedekiah, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, I'm about to turn against you the weapons of war 
that are in your hands. He said, I'm, I'm going to use your own, your own weapons against you, which you are using to fight the king of Babylon and the Babylonians who are outside the wall besieging you. And I will gather them inside this city. I myself will fight against you with an outstretched hand and a mighty arm in furious anger and in great wrath. Can you imagine how angry that made God when they came around and said, maybe he'll do a miracle for us. I will strike down those who live in this city, both man and beast, and they will die of a terrible plague. After that, declares the Lord, I'll give Zedekiah, the king of Judah, his officials and the people in this city who survived the plague, sword and famine into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and to their enemies who want to kill them, he will put them to the sword. He will show them no mercy, pity, or compassion. When we look at the end of Jeremiah, we'll mention it again later. But Zedekiah had a horrible death. Um, well, he died in Babylon, in fact. He was taken to Babylon. But Nebuchadnezzar personally, because Nebuchadnezzar let Zedekiah reign there in Jerusalem, but he tried to revolt against Nebuchadnezzar. So Nebuchadnezzar personally took his young sons, stood him before him, and murdered them. Then, he gouged out the eyes of Zedekiah and took him to Babylon. And there he died. So we see in chapter 21 and verses 8 through 10, God giving them an opportunity to get out. They still still won't listen. Look at verse 8. Furthermore, tell the people, this is what the Lord says. See, I'm setting before you the way of life and the way of death. Whoever stays in this city will die by the sword, famine, or plague. But whoever goes out and surrenders to the Babylonians who are besieging you will live. They will escape with their lives. Now, of course, again, remember, when Jeremiah preaches a message like that, they think he's, he's a what? A traitor. They think he's a traitor. God says, I have determined to do this city harm and not good, declares the Lord. It will be given into the hands of the king of Babylon, and he will destroy it with fire. So in, even in the midst of all the horror... He's given them a chance to get out of town, and they don't take it. They believe their prophets. They believe their king. And they don't believe God who speaks. And God, of course, has to do with evil prophets. And uh, we see that in chapter 23. But quickly, let's look at, well, we can't. I've got to quit. I didn't realize. I had us down for chapters uh, down to 23, but I'm not going to take time for that. It's, I didn't realize it was a little bit after 8. I get long-winded. Uh, so uh, I'll pick up with 22, and we're going to see there how God judges all the kings, Shalom, Jehoiakim, and Jehoiakim. And the odd thing is, and I'll, I'll, this will be my closing statement, these are children and grandchildren of the great king Josiah, one of the best kings of Israel. He had before him two of the worst kings of Israel, his grandpa Manasseh and then his father was wicked, wicked, wicked. But he himself was one of the best kings. Then his children were wicked. And so... Uh, we see that his children and grandchildren, who become the next three kings, uh, there's judgment on them. 
And then there's some hope in chapter 23 as he talks about a prophecy of Jesus. And we'll look at that next time. Is there anything you want to comment on about the reading we had tonight? 